Good morning, Chapel Street family. My name is Emma Crucial, and it is so good to be with you today. Please remain standing for the reading of the Beatitudes. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. You may be seated. Thank you, Emma, for that reading. Uh, It is good to read them out loud together. This series we're in uh, called Kingdom Citizens on these uh, eight statements of Jesus. We call them the Beatitudes, these blessing statements of Jesus. Last week, we kicked off the series. Dr. Dixon did a fantastic job. I want to encourage you, if you missed that, maybe you're out of town or hopefully not sleeping in. Either way, uh, if you missed it, go back and you can watch that sermon. It's worth your time to go and and, uh, dig into that as we go on in this series. Uh, these, um, These eight statements of blessing, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. We're gonna take each one of them each week and dig into them. But just that word blessed, I wanna pause on that for a minute. What comes into your mind when you hear the word blessed? Do you think hashtag blessed, like people making Facebook posts about, you know, there's one, hashtag blessed. <laughs> what, 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 is, uh, what, come, what do you think about the blessed life? What does that mean to you? I can't hear that word without thinking of a woman named Miss Juanita Williams. Here's a picture of Miss Williams. Um, uh, you'll see her, you can probably figure out which one she is, but just in case you can't quite exactly, there she is right there. This is uh, the Rosen neighborhood in the south side of Chicago, 25 years ago, leading a group of high school students. Uh, we would paint her porch white every year because she wanted a fresh white porch to be a symbol of hope and, uh, and the light of Christ in her neighborhood, a very dark uh, neighborhood, difficult, brokenness, trouble, addiction, crime, and so on. She wanted her home and her porch to be a symbol of God's grace. So she made us paint her porch white every year. She asked us to. And uh, whenever we would ask Miss Williams, how are you doing? Because we'd get there and the students would say, how are you doing, Miss Williams? And she'd say, I'm blessed and highly favored, child, and so are you. <laughs> and that became a thing our kids, students said to each other. They became like a little, they would ask each other, how are you doing? Blessed and highly favored. They'd say it to each other all the time. And I, every time I hear the word blessed, I think of her. She's with Jesus now. But I think about that story. And what does it mean to be blessed and highly favored? Particularly when Jesus says, blessed and highly favored are the meek, the merciful, the poor in spirit, the hungry and thirsty, the peacemakers, the persecuted. That uh, doesn't quite make sense on first hearing. Maybe it is a good idea for us, though, when the next time someone asks you how you're doing, just to say, blessed and highly favored, how are you? What if you don't feel blessed or highly favored, though? What if just life is not going great? We're, We're conditioned to think of blessing as circumstantial, a subjective feeling based on how it's going. New job, blessed. Lost my job, not blessed. Birth of a baby, blessed. My child is struggling or sick, not blessed. Got engaged, blessed. Marriage is falling apart, not blessed. Like it's, it's it, we, we think of it in terms of how's it going? How am I feeling? How am I experiencing my life? But that's not at all how blessed is presented to us in the Beatitudes. When Jesus says blessed are, he's not talking about subjective feelings based on circumstances. He's pronouncing something to be true of people in his kingdom, regardless of their circumstances, even in spite of them. Blessed are the poor in spirit. 
Blessed are the meek, the merciful, the mourning, the persecuted. You are. Whether you feel it in the moment or not, it is the condition he says you're in. If you're his child. The Greek word for blessed here used is the word makarios. Sometimes translated happy or fortunate, blessed. I've heard some people translate it congratulations. Congratulations all you who mourn. Or to use in, in, in honor of Dr. Dixon, good on you. Good on you, mate, if you're mourning. Good on you if you're uh, persecuted. Think about that. Fortunate, happy, congratulate. Can you imagine going to a funeral and saying to the widow, congratulations. Congratulations. You get to mourn. You're blessed. That would be horribly inappropriate and rude. I'm not suggesting you do that. But that's why it sounds so strange to us. That all sounds good until you start to, uh, blessing sounds good until you start to dig into what is Jesus saying here. This is the, how the greatest and, and, and most, uh, the highest moral and ethical teaching of Christ, the vision of the kingdom life, we call it the Sermon on the Mount, it begins with such a shocking statement. Last week, uh, Dick, John Dixon said, there's a content warning needed for the Beatitudes. They have uh, transformed lives and upended empires. I think that's worth us thinking about. These simple, radical, strange statements. How strange they must have sounded to those who heard them 2,000 years ago and how strange they sound still to us. John Stott says, the Sermon on the Mount is probably the best known part of the teaching of Jesus, though arguably it is the least understood and certainly it is the least obeyed. It is the nearest thing to a manifesto that he, Jesus, ever uttered. For it is his own description of what he wanted his followers to be and to do. It is the most complete delineation anywhere in the New Testament of the Christian counterculture. I love that quote. The, the, the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes in particular are the purest place we get Jesus' kingdom vision. The countercultural kingdom vision, what he wants us to be and to do as kingdom citizens, with Christ as our king. We call it the Sermon on the Mount, but it really wasn't on a, a mount. If you've ever been to the Holy Lands, you know, it's, it's uncertain exactly where it took place, but it's somewhere on the slopes on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. You'll see a picture here of what's traditionally called the Hill of the Beatitudes. That's the Church of the Beatitudes there, and, uh, nearest in the, in the right corner, and that, those are the, that's the hillside in the Sea of Galilee in the distance. Somewhere on those slopes, this took place. And by the way, it wasn't a one-time sermon. Do you ever, maybe I shouldn't ask this, do you ever feel like your pastor says the same thing a lot of times? Like he's kind of, it always comes back to Jesus or something or the gospel, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> well, it does. But also I think Jesus had kind of a singular message, the message of the kingdom. So what we have here is actually a sermon he gave, but not just once, over and over and over again, these things. It's, it, was, it was preaching it to all who would listen, the message of the kingdom. Next slide is a picture I took from the Sea of Galilee of the Hill of the Beatitude. That's the same church there in the distance, in the center of your screen. Somewhere on those slopes, thousands of people from all over the region gathered. They sat down. Jesus sat down, which was the position to teach for a Jewish rabbi. And the first words out of his mouth are Matthew 5, 1 through 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Shocking. St. Augustine says this about the Sermon on the Mount. Anyone who piously and earnestly ponders the Sermon on the Mount, as we read in the Gospel according to Matthew, I believe he will find therein the perfect standard of the Christian life. The perfect standard of the Christian life. Would you like to live the perfect, or know what the perfect standard of the Christian life is? You ever struggle like, well, Lord, what do you want, or what am I supposed to do? He tells you the perfect standard of the Christian life. There's just one problem. How many of you have ever read Matthew 5, 6, and 7 at any point in your life? Come on, put your hands up high. If not, go home, press pause on the DVR and read that, right? It's, it's the Sermon on the Mount. It's the perfect standard of the Christian life. Here's the problem. If you've read that thoughtfully, reflectively, you can't do it. You can't do it. Jesus has things like, you've heard do not commit adultery, but I tell you, if you even look at a woman lustfully, you've already done the act in your heart. You've heard it said don't commit murder, but I tell you, if you hate your brother, you've murdered him in your heart. I mean, who can live up to that? And it begins with these crazy statements, like this one, Matthew 5, 1 through 3. When he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, blessed, fortunate, 
lucky, happy, congratulations, are the poor in spirit. What? That's the blessed life? By the way, when Jesus goes up on the mountain hillside and sits down to teach, there's another story in the Old Testament of one who went up on a mountain and received the word of God to give to the people. His name was Moses. You might know that story. Jesus is very clearly, it's, it's like the new and better Moses is here. Because he'll say in this sermon, I came not to fulfill, abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Not to do away with it, but I fulfill it. And I'm giving to you the new law. Kingdom vision. And the first word in that kingdom vision is, you can't do this. Because to be poor in spirit means to know that you don't have any hope or you're helpless, spiritually speaking. D.A. Carson defines it this way. Poverty of spirit is the personal acknowledgement of our spiritual bankruptcy. It is a conscious confession of our unworth before God. As such, it is the deepest form of repentance. It's, it's to be desperate. In Luke's gospel, he says, blessed are the poor. Doesn't say poor in spirit. Some think, well, Matthew has sort of softened it, made it easier to swallow by putting spirit on there. I think they're both saying the same thing. The same Greek word used for poor. But, it, and it doesn't mean, the Bible does not teach anywhere in the scriptures that if you're materially poor, you are by the virtue of being materially poor, blessed. Or if you're materially rich, you are by virtue of being materially rich, cursed. What it's saying is, people who are materially poor, who have physical needs and are desperate for food and provision, they have an advantage because they know what it means to be desperate to live. And sometimes though the comfortable wealthy, which you don't think of yourself as wealthy, but you are in the world's economy, we all are, we have a disadvantage because we're distanced from that desperation. We don't live with a day-to-day -day awareness of our desperate need for God. And so we, it's harder for us to learn it, to live it, to believe it. But every now and then, every now and then, something happens in life, doesn't it, that makes you a little desperate. Something happens in your life that you know, I cannot do this. I'm helpless here. Somebody gets sick that you love, and the doctors say, we've exhausted all our resources. Some of you know Dan and Beth Griebel, part of our church family, and praying for their son, Jackson. They know desperation right now as a mother and father, desperate for their son to be healed. Something happens in your marriage, it feels like it's coming apart, and all your efforts to save it feel like it's coming to nothing. You face your own failure, right? Something happens every now and then, and that seems like the end is terrible, it's tragic, and there is a lot of pain, but there's a goodness to it. Not that it happened, but that it teaches us something about our desperation for God. Because what Jesus says is, this is the foundation here. We can't have a kingdom conversation until you understand this. It all starts here. Poverty of spirit. This just culturally doesn't make sense to us. Uh, Christian Smith wrote a book in 2005 where he defined the, the primary view people that were in the ages of 15 to 20 had of God. So this is 19 years ago. So those people are now in midlife. They grew up thinking of God, and he called it this, moralistic, therapeutic deism. Moralistic, God wants you to be good. Therapeutic, God wants you to feel good about yourself. Deism, he's not that involved unless you're in desperate need and you call out to him to help you, you get on a test or something. And then God lets the good people into heaven. That's how most of our culture thinks about religion if they think about it at all. God wants us to be good, to feel good, to be happy, and he lets the good people into heaven. That's not at all what Jesus says. I was listening to a recent lecture on the Sermon on the Mount uh, while driving with a friend of mine, and uh, the, the, the author, the lecturer, said the majority of institutional religion in, in the church today is concerned with helping people maintain a positive self-image rather than truly encountering God. I had to stop, press pause, rewind, and write that down. I think that's true. May it never be true of us. I don't want to be guilty of that. That all this that we're doing would just be helping you feel good about yourself? Just maintain a good self-image? If your goal of coming to church is I come and we get here and I want to walk out feeling better than I came in. I don't want you to walk out feeling miserable. 
But the goal of Christianity is not to make everybody feel good about themselves all the time. It doesn't start there. It begins with a deep recognition of my desperate need for God, that I'm helpless without him. This means, this is why poverty of spirit is the gateway to kingdom life. The gateway to kingdom life. It's the only point of entry. There are no people in the kingdom who are not poor in spirit. Doesn't work that way. There's no side door for the proud. There's only one. I mentioned before that Luke calls just the poor, not poor in spirit. The Greek word they both use is the word tokos. And it literally means crouched or bent over. And it's the word in Greek used to describe the lowest class in society. There's another Greek word uh, that's a, not the one they used uh, that was used, the Greek uh, panikros, which meant just needy, just the needy. It's very interesting that neither Luke nor Matthew just talk about the, the needy, like you're, you, you have some need. But they, they choose intentionally the word that describes the bottom rung of society, being at the bottom. Those in the recovery movement talk, call call it hitting rock bottom. In fact, I was talking to a friend of mine and he said, poor in spirit, we we talk about that in the first two steps. We've admitted we are powerless over our addiction that our lives have become unmanageable. And we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves, only a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. That's the recovery movement's description of poverty of spirit. I can't do this. I need help from outside of me. Most of us just don't think this way. It's a paradox that's misunderstood by Christians and non-Christians alike. That brokenness could be the pathway to blessedness. How does that work? It's all over scripture. Jesus tells a parable in Luke 18 of a a tax collector and a Pharisee. And they're in in, uh, temple praying. And the tax collector or the Pharisee, excuse me, stands up and prays out loud. And he prays God, he prays about himself. God, thank you that I'm not like other people. Can you imagine praying that out loud? Lord, thank you. I'm not perfect, but look at these suckers. I, can, I give a half of, I give a tenth of, I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of all that I own. Look at what I, thank you, Lord, that I'm so righteous. And here's what the tax collector says. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So poverty of spirit is not only the gateway or entry point to the kingdom, it's the key that unlocks all the rest of the Beatitudes that follow. They all flow from that condition, poverty of spirit. Martin Lloyd-Jones in his massive commentary on the Sermon on the Mount puts it this way. It is no coincidence that poor in spirit is listed first among the Beatitudes. It is the key to all of the rest that follow. There is no one in the kingdom of God that is not poor in spirit. In this sense, all of the other Beatitudes are dependent on this one. So the Beatitudes are not a list of eight different kinds of people. Like you don't get to say, well, I'm not very meek, but I'm pretty good at peacemaking. Well, I don't mourn very well, but you know, I, I, I don't mind being persecuted. <laughs> it's, a, it's a description of the kingdom ethic, what God wants us to be and to do, that we can't apart from him. So we don't pick and choose from the list. And this means poverty of spirit is countercultural. It's radically countercultural. It just doesn't make sense in our self-actualized, self-promoting culture obsessed with achievement and image. I struggle with this. All the sports that I played growing up through high school and college were all about like asserting yourself, dominating your opponent, being strong, not showing weakness. Like by temperament and by upbringing, it's, it's difficult. Poor in spirit. No coach that I ever had ever said, all right, men, here's the key to success. Let's be poor and humble. Let's be meek out there today. Right? <laughs> it cuts against everything in me. And maybe in you too. It's certainly not something we celebrate in our culture. Think about that for just a minute. What are the, what are the characteristics that we celebrate, admire, praise, post about in our society today? In fact, 
uh, I was talking with a friend about this and he texted me this little list that he got from Ray Ortland. I adapted it for our purposes called the Unbeatitudes of this world. Congratulations to the entitled for this world lies at their feet. Congratulations to the carefree for they shall be comfortable. Congratulations to the pushy for they shall get ahead. Congratulations to the greedy for they shall climb the food chain. Congratulations to the vengeful for they shall be feared. Congratulations to those who don't get caught. For they shall look good. Congratulations to the argumentative, for they shall get in the last word. Congratulations to the popular, for this world lies at their feet. It is an interesting exercise, isn't it, to think about the things our culture praises, idolizes, admires. It isn't the, it isn't the Beatitudes Jesus listed. You could make your own list. Can you imagine a presidential candidate who decided to make poverty of spirit, meekness, peacemaking, and mercy the center of their campaign? I mean, I'm serious. Could, that, could such a person get elected today? Class? No. <laughs> no, they get laughed off the stage. We don't, and frankly, we don't want that as Americans. We want someone to tell us they have the answers and they're gonna make it all right. And every candidate, but this is not, a, every candidate ever on every side of the aisle says this. I'm the only one, vote for me, I'll make it right. We have the way, we have the answers. And I'm not saying there aren't better choices than others. What I'm saying is something in us just doesn't really admire, understand, want these characteristics but this is the kingdom citizenship Jesus offers. This is who he was. This is how he lived. Poverty of spirit is countercultural and last poverty of spirit is foundational to the kingdom life. It's foundational to the kingdom life. It's the entry point, it's the essential characteristic of kingdom citizens and it, it is the foundation for everything God wants to do in you. All that God wants to give you, all the blessings he wants to pour out on you, all that he wants to produce in your, in your heart and soul and your relationships, all that he wants to do through you to bless the world, it all starts here. This is the foundation. Think about it in relation to the other people who are broken. If the word means at the bottom. If you know that God blesses you when you are broken and at the bottom, and you know you didn't deserve it. You know you couldn't get out of there on your own. That radically transforms how you see other broken people at the bottom and how you treat them. It is the difference between having pity for someone and identifying with someone. There's a, there's a, there's a, a massive difference between, oh, I feel so bad that you have to go through that. Let me, let me pray for you, offer you a little money if I can, and I'm good. I hope you find some help. Versus, I've been there. Maybe not materially where you are, but I know that kind of desperation because spiritually speaking, we're all the same. I know what it means to be helpless. I'm with you. Recognizing the brokenness in ourselves is the first step in being qualified to engage the brokenness of the world. Jesus says, you wanna talk about the kingdom life? Let's start here. Let's talk about how do you understand our relationship. If humility is like the horizontal way we relate to each other, we should live, we're, we're told to be humble. You could think of poverty of spirit as like humility aimed vertically. It's our vertical relationship with God, our posture toward God, our understanding of the foundation of our relationship with God. Uh, St. Augustine, uh, in addition to right, being a brilliant theologian, probably one of the greatest theologians in all of history, certainly before uh, the Reformation, and he's, he's the towering intellect, uh, wrote a remarkable works of theology uh, and commentary. And he also has a collection of his letters to one of his students. And I was reading through some of these, and this is one I found really funny. He wrote to one of his students uh, uh, named Dioscorus, who was writing to him, begging him to give him like theological and spiritual insight into some things. And, he was, and, and Augustine was becoming annoyed with him. 
who kept pestering him with these questions that were, dis- that were betraying the young man's own arrogance. And here's what he says to him. I think it's funny, but true. I wish you to submit with complete devotion and to construct no other way for yourself of grasping and holding the truth than the way constructed by him, who as God saw how faltering were our steps. This way is first humility, second humility, third humility. And however often you should ask me, I would say the same. <laughs> like if you can keep asking me, I'm gonna keep telling you, humility, humility, humility. Poor in spirit, poor in spirit poor in spirit. It's not a destination that we arrive at. It's a lifelong journey of surrendering over and over and over again. Jesus says, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the last beatitude, blessed are those who persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those are the only two where it's present tense. Theirs is the kingdom. Do you notice this? Every other beatitude is future. Blessed are those who mourn, they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. Blessed are the peacemakers, they will be called children of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Every other beatitude is future facing. These two are present tense. I think what it's saying to us is we have the kingdom now in our hearts, in our lives, the blessings, the grace, and the mercy, and the joy, and the fulfillment, and the love, and the peace of Christ as our King now, because we know these things will be true one day, even if we don't always experience them right now. They will. You will be fulfilled. You will be called children of God. You will see God. And so I can, so I don't have to make that happen. I know that that's true. That's mine now. So I can live as his child. And the kingdom, by the way, is a gift. In Luke's gospel, Jesus says, fear not, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. You can, you can only receive a gift. You can't grasp it. You can't take it. You can't claim it. You can't earn it. You can only receive it. And you cannot receive it if you're holding on to something else. If you're clutching to your kingdom to your pride, to my identity, to my whatever. In fact, this is the posture that gets in our way. Take your hands for a minute, ready? I know, know, everybody do this with me. And just make two fists and go right here. What what can you do from this posture? What does this posture mean? You can fight, right? I can fight, I can defend, I can protect. It's a posture of fear, aggression, defensiveness, isn't it? Keep your fists there. Now do this. Can you fight from this position? Maybe. <laughs> not, not really, right? What, what can you do from this position? Receive. It's a posture of surrender. It's the best physical representation, I think, of poverty of spirit. I think the condition of our souls and our, and our hearts and, and our culture is to do this. We drift into this position. Too many of us as Christians... We call ourselves kingdom citizens, but we're like this, fighting for our rights, fighting against whoever we think is wrong. Do they have the right theology? They believe what I believe. Are they going to vote the way I'm going to vote? Are they going to take away my... Right? I'm doing this all the time. And I think, I think poverty of spirit is a daily going, Lord, I got nothing. I got nothing. Help me open my hands again because I just drift into this. It's in, my, it's in me, and I want to live like this. I want to live like this before you and before other people. The world doesn't need any more of this. For many of us, it needs more open-handed, surrendered people. Reminds me of the hymn, Rock of Ages. Not the Def Leppard song, but the the great hymn, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Here's the lyrics. And do this with me, right? Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked, come to thee for dress. Helpless, right? Look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior, or I die. That's poverty of spirit. And the whole kingdom life starts there. And you don't graduate from there. You don't, you don't move on from there to become proud of spirit. Like I enter in poor, but then I raise up to the top. No, we stay there. We stay right there. Most of the spiritual life Learning to live Jesus' way is just returning, right? People will say to me sometimes, oh, I want new, deeper teaching. 
And they think, they, they think they mean like, I want, to know, I want to hear something I haven't heard before. I love learning new things. I, I get excited about that. It's my favorite thing, learning new stuff. I, oh, I didn't know that. I get excited about sharing it. But that's actually not what I need most. And it's not what you need most. What I need most is to get what I already know into here. To help me go like this. Jesus says, this, this kingdom life, this vision of the kingdom is beyond you. So open your hands and let me fill them. Open your hands and let me fill them with the joy and the grace and the mercy and the love and the peace of the kingdom. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So fear not, little flock. Let's bow. Lord Jesus, nothing in our hands do we bring. Simply to your cross we cling and we confess that we can't hold on to your cross if our hands are full of other stuff. And for most of us, they are. We're holding on to our identity, our career, our reputation, our need to control. Remind us, Lord, that we're, we are poor in spirit. We have nothing to bring to you. And when we get that, you shower us with your kingdom grace. Thank you, Jesus, for being our good and gracious king. We pray this in your name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you who are citizens of the kingdom of God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.